Ahoy, fellow workers of the world. And welcome aboard the Joy of Trek, a unionized podcast exploring the picket lines and holding cells of Star Trek. All, all of it. it. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. And punishing strike breakers is your chief engineer, Greg. Together, we're on a mission through the coal mines of Star Trek to find the bullet holes in every union man Yikes. and the excellence in every episode. Even the gooey worm food. <laughs> because every episode must be someone's favorite, and it might as well be us. So step on your employees and join us as we brawl into the, the joy, joy of, of Trek. Trek. Wow. You guys have a union? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Has Craig been doing things behind our back? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hang on. Wait. Are we management now? I don't know. <laughs> Helmut, do you think we're the baddies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh, can you guess which episode we're talking about today? Correct. It is DS9 episode, season 14, episode 19, Bar Association. Neither of those are correct. What? The only number you got correct was the 9 in DS9. Do you want to uh, take another? 419, right? Or 416. Yeah, so not oh. 14, season 14, no, episode where? 19, <laughs> which I've... God, if only we'd had that. <laughs> but yes. Bar Association, aired on February 19th, 1996. Oh, what a year. Written by Barbara J. Lee and Jennifer A. Lee. Related? Sisters. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, their only Tele credit on the, on Star Trek. Teleplay by Robert Hewitt Wolf and Iron Stephen Beyer, and directed by LeVar Burton. Yeah. Ah. Excellent. Yes, like, while while much can be said about the uh, Rick Berman era of Star Trek, one of the things... Much that has been said by the Rick er about the Rick er Berman era of Star Trek. No, one of the things that was truly, truly excellent was... Oh, let me see what it was called. I think it was called, like, Paramount University, something to that effect. Greg, can you please correct us on that? So, near as I can tell, it's just the Trek Directors Club, not Paramount University. So this was a program where actors who were interested in, in directing mm -hmm. had the ability to, like, it was sort of like a three-month program right. where you could shadow the editors of the episode that you were doing. And it meant, like, doing double work. You know, you'd, right. you'd have your regular acting workload, and then you'd also go into the editing room and then the sound mixing room okay. and, the, and, and the writer's room to, to sort of see how all the jobs were done. Nice. And eventually, like serve as an assistant director and then direct your own episode nice yeah. that's how we got lavar burton jonathan frakes oh certainly roxanne dawson yeah. she was uh Belana torres right F uh, frakes was already uh directing episodes in uh, next generation right yeah exactly yeah. he was one of the first graduates of this okay, program yeah. cool so we got some really excellent yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I bet so they had a good union well <laughs> <laughs> yes oh i don't know how how this lines up with the the timelines like i know in starting the next generation between the second and third season there was a, a strike of the writers guild yeah and oh, yes. Management. yes much like we recently had i mean last year it was a quite long strike of the writers guild followed by a strike uh -huh. of the actors guild and uh, where this episode bar association got a lot of play in the star trek <laughs> uh, in the star trek community i can well imagine and in a first, I copied an image into our sort of recording script. Yeah. I got this from Memory Alpha, and it's LeVar Burton, who looks absolutely oh. radiant. Oh, yes. I, didn't, I hadn't really seen that far yet. On my screen, it was clipped just having uh, the Ferengi standing there. I didn't see that it was LeVar Burton actually in that shot as well. Yeah, directing the bar staff. And, like, he looks so amazing in his... He's got, like, a waistcoat. He's got these bracelets, gorgeous, like, earrings, and his tight-cropped haircut. Because I think they were just about doing first contact. Okay, well, yeah. That was his, uh, his look. He's got a bit of a beard going. Oh. Very unimpressed looking uh, double girl. Lita? Oh, I think she's paying attention. Yeah. Chase Masterson is oh, uh, yes. the one who plays Lita. She'd been introduced previously, and she was love interest for Julian Bashir. Right, yes. But she ended up with Rom in the end. Yes. A decision that was partly motivated yeah. by this episode because their chemistry is amazing. Yeah. Like, as soon as the, the producers saw them together, huh, We yeah. need to do more with this, yeah. Uh -huh. Everybody loves seeing them. Oh, I have to do my synopsis, <laughs> yeah, right, that's sorry. right, ah, that's right, that's yes. right. Hey, you have a job. Oh, I was scrolling for the, sorry, I was scrolling for the synopsis. Okay, so this is in no way scripted or prepared. This is just me off the top of my head. Okay, I believe in you. You've done so amazing. <sighs> okay. All right, so DS9, season four, Episode 16, Nailed Bar it. Association. Yep. <laughs> the Ferengi of Quark's bar, in protest against having their pay docked, decide to start a union and fight with the uh, no, no, no less than Bert. 
Brunt. 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 That was Brunt. his name. Brunt FCA. of the FCA. I, he is my favourite Ferengi. Right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, battle Quark in a bid to get better working conditions. Yeah. Sick leave, paid overtime, vacation, paid vacation. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah. All, the, yeah, all these things that are, that are completely shocking to Ferengi sensibilities. Yes. They've been corrupted by Bajoran ideals of equality and, and, and starfleet <laughs> yes. nonsense. So, yeah, it's a bit of a boring synopsis, I'm afraid. There's not much I can do with it. Well, let me add the B plot then. Oh. Because originally, when the Lee sisters pitched this, there was an effort to find, like, to make it a B plot for another script. Yeah. But eventually, it just turned out to be too rich a vein. But it's paired with Worf settling into DS9 and, like, struggling to fit in with, like, how much looser and dirtier life on a station is. I really didn't get that plot. I mean, I saw it happen, mm -hmm. and I'm just sitting there, like, okay, what? Is this going? Like, why is Worf being such a whiny little bitch? Well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily fair. <laughs> I'm a bit of a Worf apologist in, uh, a, in, in a lot of ways. But, like, yeah, he, he struggles with things like this, all sorts of inconveniences that he encounters yeah. that are just, like, that's what you get when you have a revolving door of people just passing through. He's used to a lot more precision. And discipline, and but he's a little bit bitchy about, you know, the condition of the defiant. Okay. Okay, no, this is great, this is great. <laughs> so we now have a sort of an axis where we're going to operate on this because I thought it was brilliant. Okay. As, oh, and hey, we had a recommendation. Yes. This time we double didn't forget, you remembered. Hi, I'm Crimson, he, him, a coy wolf from the mountains of Virginia who lives in the suburbs of Chicago. I'm a lifelong martial artist. I do, in fact, study the blade, and I am incapable of not making things. So I dabble in writing, music, photography, blacksmithing, and leatherworking. I more than dabble in baking. Sometimes I dabble in organizing as I maintain a membership in the industrial workers of the world, just this world, and have been fortunate enough to assist in an organizing campaign. Alas, unsuccessful and oddly similar to this episode. So my recommendation for DS9 416 Bar Association is, it's the Union episode. What's not to love about it? Is it the Grand Epic Dominion War stuff? No. Is it Far Beyond the Stars? No. But is it still infuriatingly relevant, just like listening to an old Jim Crows or Woody Guthrie song? Absolutely. Does it also feature O'Brien hamming it up about all his Union men ancestors who died horrible deaths at the hands of cruel bosses, a fact about which he's quite proud, as any good Irishman would be? Absolutely. Now, is this the correct way to go about forming a union? Absolutely not. They jumped way in the deep end without setting up support correctly, but no oh well, no oh well. Such is Rom. This is a great episode with basically no room at all for B-plot, which I think is just fine. Welcome to the industrial workers of the world, fellow workers. Well said, Crimson. <laughs> Thank you for the recommendation. And here, too, I think there is a B-plot, and I actually kind of like it. It's just a little one, but it's it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. So shall we jump into the episode? We can, we can have a little B-plot if you want, as a treat. Yeah, just a, li <laughs> just a little bit, a little B. Here we go. All right, it is Bajoran Ramadan, and... No, it starts with the B plot. For goodness' sake! Oh it right, yes, you, starts no, with. Yes, with so, it's Worf so unmemorable and irrelevant that I completely forgot about it. Okay, there's even a C plot. Oh, and I'll ask you to pay attention to the okay. C plot, which is Jadzia is flirting at Worf pretty hard. Oh yes, and constantly. He's, yeah, and he's just not getting at it, and she's just enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> because the Defiant has docked back on DS9. Successful mission. During our maneuvers through that asteroid belt in the Cartilus system, I noticed the Defiant felt a little sluggish when turning hard to port. The inertial dampening generators may need to be realigned. I'll begin drawing up a schedule immediately. Which is yes. weird for someone who's sitting in the captain's chair and not, like, actually directly in com <laughs> control. Yeah, you'd think so, yeah. I like that this is completely, like... E even though she says O'Brien's going to be a little disappointed, he thought he finally had the ship running smoothly. And Worf immediately goes, "No, O'Brien has done an excellent job." But it is my duty to keep her functioning at peak proficiency. I'd previously questioned, "What's the deal with the Defiant? What's the deal with the Defiant just yeah. sort of hanging around and not being of much use while it's not being captain?" But of course, Worf is the the sort of backup commander and takes it out onto missions, mm -hmm. which. You know, I still sort of struggle with because Worf has a full-time job as the strategic officer of DS9. And yeah, any time that he and Jadzia are off on a mission, they're not on doing DS9. their other yeah. jobs. And any time that they're not crewing the Defiant, an amazing weapons platform is just sort of sitting around doing nothing. Yeah, I mean, it's, maybe it's around there for defense. I mean, the, the, does DS9 has weapons? 
Does yes, it does. Yeah. And as of this point, season four. Um, no, it has shields, but I wasn't sure about the weaponry. Oh, well, let's have a little quote of the weaponry that, uh, <laughs> that DS9 boasts. Right now, I've got 5,000 photon torpedoes armed and ready to launch. If you don't believe me, feel free to scan the station. Thank you, uh, Chief. <laughs> oh, now here's an interesting one. I don't know which clip the Chief chose to use here, yeah. because those lines are said twice. The first in the very first episode of DS9, oh, where it's bullshit. Y- yes. And the second time in season four, episode one, where it's actually true, because they've had upgrades. Yes. Mr. Worf, you're in love. With the Defiant. Dropping the word, hmm? Mm, yeah, love? yeah, oh, absolutely. In love, hmm? With the Defiant. With the Defiant, I mean, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <right. laughs> gruff, 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 gruff. And she breasted boobily out the room. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, none of this is the case sp- here. Speaking of boobily breasting, uh, we have Lana, who is... Uh, Lita. Lita, sorry, not Lana. Uh, oh, and for the listeners at home, this is a reference to a particular, like, example of... Didn't we do a reading of that once? <laughs> I think it was very close. <laughs> like, the stereotype of male writers writing women about, like, and focusing on their, their cleavage and the, the do-kissed, and then she breasted boobily out the, up the stairs. It was. Something like there, that, yes. There was also a version about women writing for men, which was then all about, like, the 18 different words for nutsack, yeah. which is apparently the thing that women find the most attractive about <laughs> men. I'm pretty sure we did a reading in one of our earlier episodes of that. If not, we should like, do one again. No. That's, we'll make that a Patreon thing. I'm surprised that Kaki forgot this, given how much Kaki loves my porno music or whatever. Yeah, it was in the very first episode of Sub Rosa. It was the very, very first episode of the podcast was that, which I still maintain is a choice to open up the podcast with a two-minute long reading of that fan fiction. But yes, we've done it. We've done it. We still might do it again, but we've done it. Uh, O'Brien and Bashir come walking in in, yeah, well, middle-aged Irish clothing. Yep, yep, the uh, Battle of Clontarf. Yep, they're going to fight it. How come you get to be High King? I am a direct descendant of King Brian Baru. And as was mentioned in the script, for the name Baru is not very familiar no. outside of Ireland, and Clontarf isn't isn't either. And so, whenever foreign names or or made up words are used, there's usually a pronunciation guide. And the pronunciation guide for this said, "Ask Colum," because <laughs> Colum Meany is going to be there, and he'll tell you how to say it. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and he's also the only one who says it. So yeah, just yeah, should be let a fine the Irish yeah. person say it. The, yeah, doesn't like O'Brien mean like literally mean descendant of this person? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So. A famed ancestral king. Yes. I mean, it's probably like the Genghis Khan gene. Like, by this time, like, we're a thousand years down the line. Probably everybody in Ireland is more or less descended of this person at this point. Oh, that's very well possible. Yeah. Come from a, I, too, come from a long line of sluts. Yes. Morose uh, is Quark. Right. As Be- he wanders through the empty bar. Because it is, in fact, Bajoran Ramadan. Yes. Passes for it. Yes, they're, yeah, on, their month, they're, they're on their men- month of cleansing. I mean, that's not what Ramadan's about. It's about no, I was going yeah. to say, I was going to say, but you, but it you also give up on like games and stuff. You don't give up on on work. You do your duty. No, it's about you know experiencing yeah, yeah. poverty and oh, it's, yeah. uh, and deprivation to better understand and be empathetic with your uh, right. your fellow person. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. give. Uh, uh, I believe the word for giving to charity for Ramadan is shadaka. Uh, I'm not familiar with the word. No, I am familiar with one thing. Oh. Yes. Okay, so this is this is very obscure. There's a particular country. I, my brain wants to say Tunisia. I'm not entirely sure that that's that's correct. Mm-hmm. And there's a game that's played during Ramadan, and it's uh, played at night, where the men in the village they gather around and they drink tamarind juice, yeah. a treat that's associated with this game. Yeah. And it's basically, do you know up chickens or up Jenkins? I've heard the name before, but I can't quite place it right now. Okay, it's a bar game with two teams. Yeah. So you're on one side of the table, and my team's on the other side of the table. Yeah. And my team, we start, so we have a coin. Yes. That we pass between us under the table. Oh right, yes, and, it's, and suddenly you yell, you to, chickens!" Yes. And everybody has to like hold their hands up in the air. Down, chickens! Elbows on the table and hands flat. Yes. And so the coin is under someone's hand. Right. And now your team has to point at all the hands where you think it isn't. Okay. Until finally, like it's revealed, and either you win or not. They play this game on hard mode, yeah. where all the men in the village are sitting around in this gigantic group, and one of them has to identify who's holding the coin. <laughs> it's incredibly difficult, but of course, it depends entirely on knowing everyone's tells. 
Yeah, okay. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and being able to bully one another. Nah, you're full of shit. No, you're no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just like I've seen a version of this game played where there's like seventy dudes, and the guy actually gets it right in one guess. Amazing. Damn. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, no such fun as being had in quotes. No, uh, everybody's just kind of like hanging around there. Like there's nothing really going on. The only customer there is uh, what's his name again? Uh, <laughs> Your boyfriend just called him Space, Space Be Beaker. Yes. <laughs> 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 he means more, but I can't call him anything else now. Who's that for? Me. It's one of Moogie's home remedies. Your ear? Again? I mean, it looks like he's doing a cocktail while it he's... It does, that's what he's... He's, yeah. <laughs> he's moaning. It's even, like, beautifully balanced. To, like, as soon as he pours it into this gigantic, long, manipulating cask or whatever, no, into just a Jean Grey... Yeah, that's <laughs> The foam that's, a fills up. that's a measuring glass, Kaki. The foam fills up exactly to the top, <laughs> yeah. which is very impressive. And then he pours the whole thing into, into his, his ear. ear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. He, like, he just leans back like he's going to down it. And then, yeah, it, it tilts it, at the last moment, he tilts his head and it just goes right into his <laughs> it's ear. It's so good. You get this foam on his ear. I wonder if like this was scripted and exercised and at the very last minute like the makeup department said what no <laughs> no solvents <laughs> he is not doing well he has an infection in his ear which makes him woozy yep. we see Quark being entirely uninterested and, and, and demanding that he uh, bust tables Lita is sympathetic until finally he <sighs> makes out with the floor he literally goes yeah falls over backwards passes out credits Bashir is there to inspect this uh, brutal infection of his tympanic membrane. Oh, yes. You could have died another 48 hours and you would have been bidding for a new life at the Divine Treasury. And why didn't you come in? Well, I was too busy because it states in my workers' contract I'm not allowed to leave the premises during... Work hours, yeah. So is the inf infirmary only open during work hours? That doesn't or? seem... It bad. seems odd, but yeah. Yeah. Unlikely. Well, I mean, like if they're like like a bank over here, like, you know, banks are only open between 10 and 4 when everybody's at work, so... Yeah, it is a space station, though. I guess, yeah. You'd oh, no, that. hold on, there is a night shift, as we learn in this episode. Yes, so absolutely, yeah. So, there's, there's night mode, I guess. Especially a medical center. That would have someone on staff, you know, all the time. Ah, but for emergencies, I mean, look at our, yeah. our GP. No, of course, yeah. Right, they're open during yeah. office hours, and you have to take time off work to go and visit them. Okay, yeah. Uh, you but know, you know, like, if, if a bit is falling off, or right, or you have a deadly ear infection. Yeah, but you don't know that it's deadly until you're dead. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> or you like, fall over. How do you know that you've been beaten half to death? Well, you ask for the exact same beating and see if you die right at the end of it. I'm sorry, that was really grim. I'm. <laughs> well, there's a joke about that. I'm very sorry, that wasn't a threat. There's a, there's a joke about like someone, a guy getting like a wish, but. Oh wow! Oh, what a what a cool joke! What a cool 21st century. Uh, yeah, we might want to cut that one. We might want to cut that one out. <laughs> We're amassing quite a big pile of bleeped out jokes, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> First of all, uh, though, I have to talk about like Bashir's assistant, who's just kind of like standing there. Has, I wanted to. Has, yes, thank you. Has no that lines. Nurse. Yeah, <laughs> but he like he he gets eye contact with Bashir yeah. like when when he's talking about hey you should form a union. Yeah, and dropping that line there. Like accepts the instrument, puts it down, picks up a pad, making himself look busy. Like he just did a really good job <laughs> yeah. there. And then we have get this like this this view of Bashir's little uh, the apothecary. I, I guess it is. I mean, it 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 looks like there's just like a bunch of cans of Mountain Dew on the shelf there, and some other uh, yeah uh, but things. It's well stocked. Yes, but, but with what? I mean, that like looks like a few packs of Epsom salt there in the background, and uh, yeah, this no looks idea. like a prepper's hoard. <laughs> it does a bit, doesn't it? Like one in the movies. Uh huh. Yeah, that's that's what it looks like. That's actually a very good, uh, concise uh, description of what it looks like. I kind of like. Yes. I don't remember seeing that little alcove before, but it's 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 really cool. I'm glad that you noticed the same things because I almost <laughs> skipped over them. Yeah. But in my notes, I was really quite impressed. A good nurse job that you're doing there, Mr. But uh, yes, it basically, Bashir makes some offhand comments about forming a union so that they can get better working conditions. And he goes, what? No, 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 I can't listen to that. That's like, that's illegal. Uh-huh. But indeed, yes, Quark has an announcement. The only thing this Bajoran cleansing ritual has cleansed is my profit margin. So... Starting tomorrow, everyone's salary gets cut by a third. 
And it's like, everybody goes like, that's not fair. And, and he goes, well, it's either that or, or fire half of you. Yeah. Which the math doesn't completely work there. <laughs> but like, oh, Quark is amazing at this. He's so ice cold. And Armin Shimmerman is so completely prepared to make himself like the villain who doesn't realize he's being the villain. Uh-huh. Because he's on the board of directors at the Screen Actors Guild. And he's... I mean, one of many Star Trek actors who's, mm-hmm. who's involved in SAG and SAG after. I'm not, not exactly sure if they're separate organizations. Another one of them more recently is Michelle Hurd. She plays Rafi on Picard. And she was one of the lead negotiators oh, yeah. for the recent strikes in the past year. So I guess this episode must have, yeah, really uh, spoken to him. And even though he gets to play the bad guy in this, it's still something that uh, is good to uh, put out there and have people look at. He had a quote when asked about it for the Star Trek Deep Space Nine companion. Mm-hmm. People think of this as a comic episode, and it is, of course. But in truth, it's really about union management problems. The irony of it is that I play management in the episode, so I thought <laughs> that to make Rom have a reasonably hard job as a union organizer, I would have to be tough about it to show the struggle to the audience. Although you don't see it on TV very often. This is something that goes on in America all the time. Yeah. Gosh, yes. Because he would have also, I mean, I I thought this was a brilliant insight. He would have also had the opportunity to play his own role as ridiculous. Yes. As a ridiculous oppressor, but he doesn't think so. He does play it seriously. He does play it for for full effect. He goes like, he's convinced of his own, that he's right. Yeah. Uh, And he is. And legally and culturally, right, to his uh, his perspective. And for someone like Rom, who's kind of, you know, not a very dominant uh, character. Meek is probably a better way to describe Rom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as we see, when all the employees are outraged and dismayed, Rom says, oh, I'll, I'll go talk to my brother. Mm. And he just gets absolutely steamrolled. No, no, it's not fair. I'll talk to It's either that or fire half the staff. And he goes like, oh, please, can you think about it again? And he does the asshole thing, <laughs> where it's like, for you, anything. For you, anything. Hmm. Right. No, still going ahead with it. <laughs> there, I yeah. thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like such a quirk thing. Quick little cut to the sea plot where uh, Jadzia and Worf are walking through the hallway in their lovely Klingon geese. She's swinging her mechleth. Yes. Which is getting the hang of. And reminding him that, you know, I'm actually getting getting good at this. And he's like, yeah, I thought so, but I... A Klingon warrior does not need the praise of his teacher. I'm not a Klingon warrior. I'm a beautiful and sensitive young woman who thrives on... <laughs> wow, not laying it on thick at no, all. No, exactly. <laughs> Reminding me of the aliens in, I think, Dude, Where's My Car? Who take on the shape of attractive <laughs> women but don't exactly know what it is. Right. And they get a cold like, hey, what are you guys doing here? We are not guys, says the lead alien. We are hot women with large breasts. <laughs> we are- <laughs> I seem to recall the, the aliens in Dude, Where's My Car being these two handsome Swedes. The totally gay Swedish dudes. Yes. And then there's the other aliens who are hot chicks with large breasts. Oh, right, yes. Yep. That's not- <laughs> I wonder if it holds up. I do not want to find out. <laughs> Such uh, the early 2000s. But yes, they hear something, some weird sounds, and they poke at the ceiling, and someone comes falling out of the ceiling tiles, who just happens to have been burglaring Worf's quarters. Yeah, because Jadzia finds among the things that, that, that spill around, hey, isn't this your tooth sharpener? Yeah. And Worf is livid. You touch my tooth sharpener. He bought that one from Rom. Oh. That was uh, Nog's tooth sharpener, something he'd... Oh, okay. He, yeah, he didn't know existed, and he tried it on his, on his tooth, and he was like... Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh, this is amazing. <laughs> How much? Um, goes to Odo to complain, which is like kind of funny, this, because he goes like, oh, this stuff never happened on Enterprise. And Odo picks up a data pad. That he already bip, had. Bip, yeah. And it goes he like, well. Oh, what's coming in? I better have this. He's had that for the last 15 episodes. He, for- he must have expected something along the, along the lines. Uh-huh. It's amazing how and, well prepared uh, Odo is. And just summarizes, like, Stardate 46235.7, Ferengi privateers led by Damon Lurin boarded and seized control of the Enterprise using two salvaged Klingon birds of prey. Stardate 45349.1, Berlingoff Rasmussen, a petty criminal impersonating a scientist, committed numerous acts of theft against the crew of the Enterprise. Shall I continue? And I really like this energy between them because Worf comes in sort of blustery and Odo gives as good as he gets. And oh, Worf yes. recognizes that. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, yeah, no. And they both sort of back down because, yeah, they get it. It's, it's frustrating. And Odo actually, like, really commiserates with Worf. Yeah, it irritates me too. Yeah, but this is like 
we're having a lot of people coming through the station and there's going to be some miscreants on it. Yep, yep. Meanwhile, the first of the union meetings is going ahead. And it, it's adorable how hard it is for Rom to actually say the word union. And, and especially, for all of the Ferengi. <laughs> yeah. Especially the one who is standing next to uh, Lita, who just like does a <gasps> gasp, like step backwards, like eyes go yeah, wide, like almost just, like he has a fainting spell <laughs> just at hearing the word union. Because uh, apparently unions are quite illegal on Ferenginar. Yes. That character's called Grimp. He's played by Jason Marsden. Uh-huh. Uh, a, a voice you've certainly heard is a prolific voice actor. I thought he did a great job. I really liked him in this. He had a really sort of gruff voice. Are you insane? You've just destroyed the lives of every Ferengi in this room. When the FCA finds out we've even been talking of a... A... A union. For a second, I thought he was Aaron Eisenberg. Like, oh, right, yes. You know, the same actor who played... Nog. Nog. Oh, yeah, and you see what you mean, yeah. He does have a little bit of a similar facial structure. Yeah, right? Yeah, I had a, that, that thought briefly crossed my mind as well. And the other Ferengi is Frul, and he's much more... Uh, and there's also Grunk and... Broic, who is mentioned as Briok in the subtitles. Right. A little, a little production gaff there. Bit of a sort of behind-the-scenes thing here. I write on screen captures yes. with my little tablet here, and so I've got a little pen, and so I, have, I, I usually have to, I have to pick a colour to write my notes on over top of these screen yes. caps that isn't represented there so I can see the... So the right. Deep Space Nine is pretty difficult because like on Next Generation and Voyager I can usually pick orange or green. Very rare yeah. colour. Yeah. But here, like, I'd finally sort of settled on DS9 I'll just use green and then this set has these big green lights in the background. <laughs> yes. Not making, not not making, making, making it easier. much easier, no. I noticed the alien server with the bald head who has all these jewels I thought I saw that too. That was a fantastic look, yeah. Like, I never noticed that before. We're Ferengi! And when a Ferengi sees an opportunity, what does he do? He seizes it? That's right! And I, for one, intend to grab it. Basically, Rom's argument amounts to the fact, now that I have said the U word, we are all screwed anyway, so we might as well go ahead with it. Yes. He's sort of (laughs) dipping his toe into leadership here. And, like, sensing what the audience is saying, but really, like, playing on, on emotion... Mm -hmm. which is a really powerful strategy because I need you to feel that this is important. I need all of us to feel that together and to to amplify that from one another. And I like what an ally Lita is. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, that's a very important part of that uh, exchange. It's like the the, the non-Ferengi workers. We make about a little less than half, I would say, if I look at uh, some of the overview shots who are, of course, uh, just as motivated to get their pay because, I mean, Lita says, I mean, I can't afford a pay cut. It's... Oh, yeah, it's relatively easy to tell, like, which of the... how many non-Ferengi there are. Just look over the Ferengi's heads right. and see if anybody yes. else sticks out. <laughs> Lita and this, you might miss one feathers. or two, but at most, but, uh, yeah. But, yes, Rob McCall's like, yo, since we're going to be- get hounded by the FCA anyway, let's give them something to come after us uh, union, for. Union, union, yeah. union. And then, after this great success, Rom immediately runs to Bashir and asks, OK... What is a union? Yes. Because <laughs> I've started one, <laughs> which, as our recommender for this episode, Crimson, points out, jumped straight into the deep end instead of setting up a support structure first. Yes. Which is really what you ought to. Financing, for instance, like dues, and but also legal support, like all of that stuff that you inch your way before you go on strike. Which yes, is also- usually. But, you know. Rom, I was speaking theoretically. And I've put your theory into practice. Bashir is conveniently treating O'Brien for a little assist on his neck, which gives the perfect excuse for them both to be there. Uh, is the nurse guy here? No, he's not. No, he's not. No. Oh, that's so disappointing. I'm completely obsessed with this nurse dude now. It's just Bashir treating uh, O'Brien, uh, O'Brien and uh, Rom coming in. Yeah. Union? And goes, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've got a big... Uh, he's, he's like, he's, he is bragging about his ancestry a lot this in this episode, you know? And with good reason. It's like, yes, it's, well... Who do you think led the Pennsylvania coal miners during the anthracite strike of 1902? I have no idea. Sean Aloysius O'Brien. A real historical event. Yes. Although I don't think the Allegheny River was anywhere close to where No, I think it's on the wrong side of Virginia. I I, I, I seem to recall reading something about that, yes. (laughs) Which is uh, irrelevant because that's where his ancestor ended up in with 32 bullets in him. Or was it 34? (laughs) <laughs> and Rom is blanching a little bit. Yes, you can see him kind of like going like, oh, what have I gotten myself into? Ah, uh, 
Well, he died a hero, says Bashir. Oh, no, says Brian O. <laughs> he was more than a hero. He was a union man. And that wink, that has gotten a lot of play during <laughs> the strikes in the past year. Well done, by the way, to the Writers Guild of America and SAG-AFTRA, fighting for fairness and justice for hopefully, like, at least until the next round of negotiations. And woof. Yeah. So Worf's B-plot, which is totally there, Crimson, and K, and yeah. is interesting, continues. Well, with I'm, I'll concede the first two points, Chief but not the last one. Oh, Brian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on, this bit is great. Oh, yeah, it's this a bit great joke. Because, because O'Brien goes, yeah, no, everything's constantly I, I breaking down. I love it down. here. It's like this. I love it. There's always something to do. I'm not, do you know how boring it was just sitting in that room on the Enterprise? Waiting for someone to, for to break down or for someone needing to be transported. <laughs> a reference to the absurd notion, like how often they call down to like the transport room and Chief O'Brien is just already there. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that someone is, like, always on duty in case there needs to be an emergency transporting happening. But, gosh. You'd expect that. I mean, they have, like, storage bays which have transporters in them as well. Yeah. Like, this this seems like... I mean, there is a brilliant comic, which I'm going to have to find. Actually. I think I know the one that you're talking about. Yes, it's like, but I do want to credit it. Ah, yes. John Adams produced a, a comic called Chief O'Brien at Work, which I found on Tumblr. And it's, a, it's really, if you're in a bad headspace, by the way, don't look at this comic. It's very depressing because <laughs> most yes. of the frames are just Chief O'Brien sort of standing completely motionless at a station. And then something happens, like a door opens and somebody walks in. Excuse me. Oh, no. Wrong, wrong room. Wait, wait, wait. And he just leaves and he's being left alone again. And, and he's, he's just, just like, I can transport you into any room you want. <laughs> he's so yes. lonely. <laughs> yes, I've seen that comic and it's... Yes. And that's episode eight. There are others, like <laughs> yeah. one of them where he decides to finally, like, you know what, enough of this. And he's about to, like, transport himself out into space to be vaporized <sighs> just to end yeah, his yes. torment. Oh. And then Picard calls him, Chief O'Brien, please stand by to... Uh, yes, yes, sir. <sighs> Never mind. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There are two wolves inside you. I'm sorry about the transporter accident. <laughs> So Worf is not getting, like, what he wants. Like, nobody can tell him how to deal with it other than, yeah, you just get used deal to it. Deal with it, yeah. Or you like it. Meanwhile, Quark is getting confronted with his workers and their demands. He laughs it off. <laughs> <laughs> this is no joke. Yes, it is. And the fact that you don't know that it is is what makes it so funny. It, well, it's illegal, it's immoral, it's, you know. Yep. Until they all walk past him. And then he's like, oh. Oh, this is actually happening? Wait, what? This is a literal nightmare can for they, a can, can they do this? It's like, can they actually do this? <laughs> I didn't know that was possible. And they form a picket line and they actually pay people not to go into Quarks. Yeah, that one I thought was a little bit weird. Yeah. Thank you for not patronizing Quarks and hanging out. Have, to... have a slip of Latinum, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's weird. I guess, yeah. Is that something that's done? Do you, do you have money to... I don't think so. People, I mean, donuts, I guess. You know, if you're yeah, filming a maybe, picket yeah. line, you want people to not go to... Then again, the donuts might be really good, and then people would be coming to Quarks just to get a donut, and then right. they might as well get a pint yes. while they're there. Yeah. No donuts for you. You have to be the donut Nazi. Odo comes walking in to have a little chat, agrees with Quark that it's absolutely ridiculous what's going on, and Quark goes like, well, put an end to it then. But you said... I know what I said. But I have strict orders from Captain Sisko not to impinge on your employees' freedom of expression. So Odo does a lot of like completely agreeing with people and then not solving their problems. Yeah, well, this that's... <laughs> also, can we point out how amazing this scene is? Because he first confronts Quark, who offers him a drink, yes. and then vanishes, and is <laughs> and the, the drinks that he's holding crash to the floor because they're holograms. Yes, because he's got like a holographic waiting program, which has some problems because it like doesn't always work when there's like and certain power sources nearby. They're all quarks. Yes. So throughout this scene, there's just all of these like waiter quarks walking around the background. background yes, doing things and. <laughs> Oh, that's given me an idea for my uh, deleted scene. Let me see if I remember it by the time that we get around to that. Because, yes, they're not bothering anyone. They're not blocking the second entrance on the upper level, which is where Julian and Brian are. Which I thought was really weird. They're just, like, they're just sitting there like two bored teenagers. They're sitting teenagers. there like Jake and Nog, except they're not ogling right. the Bajoran girls exactly. coming in. They're, they're just, just like sitting there playing will they or won't they about whether people are going to walk into the bar or not. Yeah. And the first one is a Vulcan science officer. 
And she did, and he goes, no, nah. pass. their <laughs> ethics are so strong, she'll just ignore it. Correct. The next is a couple of... Packlets. Packlets. Of their species. Oh, okay. And yep, they go in because they're like up for a drink. And next is Worf. Amazingly. Yeah. And O'Brien is like, ah, oh, no, he'll never go in there. And yet he does. Wait a minute. I can't believe it. He's an enter. Not for long. No, this cross is... a picket line. <laughs> and this is all fairly reasonable in terms of like their emotions. Like he doesn't overreact or anything. No. He's like, hey, hang on. No, no, no. This is my friend. I'm going to have a, I'm going to yeah, have a chat with I'm him. I'm going to have a word with him. Cuts he... to it's a Cisco's, hard cut. Cisco's office who is doing a, why is when there's trouble, it's always you three. <laughs> I know. <laughs> It's like the Potter trio being called into Dumbledore's office. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why is, why is it when there's trouble? It's, oh, no, it's McGonagall's office, I believe, that one. <laughs> why is it when there's trouble? It's always you three. That's like, I, I found a lot of uh, reminiscence of that scene in here. <laughs> yeah, because we're the protagonists of the book. And it's, yeah. kind of, it's kind of like our whole right. thing. You yes. Know? So, yes. They look the worst for wear. Well, mostly Bashir, who's gotten a bit of a bump on his forehead. Oh, a uh, bleeding bump. Uh, Rhino's got a shiner. Uh, does he? Oh. Yeah, left eye. Look at that. Three of my senior staff brawling on the promenade. With all due respect, sir, we, we weren't brawling. Maybe you should take a closer look at Dr. Bashir's forehead. We had a minor disagreement, and, there, and then there was a bit of shoving. shoving. One, one of them was an accident. And Julian got bent over the table. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I wonder what your deleted scene is. <laughs> and Cisco, hey, by the way, I love this look for Cisco. Oh, yes, he looks very great. Right, yeah. he's got his head shaved, he's got the beard. And for some reason, like, I really like him in the, in the original DS9 uniform with, the, with this particular look. Yeah. Because it was a little leaner. Like, the first contact uniforms, they had the grey-purple, more like quilting on the shoulders. Right, yes. And this and is... makes, makes people look, you know, bigger and buffer. And, mm-hmm. uh, and this is a bit more more sort of lean look that I really, really like on uh, Avery Brooks. But, uh, yes, after a bit of a dressing down and, okay, now I'm going to have to get involved with this bloody strike here myself. And as he leaves, he said, I'll, I'll tell Odo to let you go. In the morning, <laughs> yes. So they're basically <laughs> confined overnight. Cisco sits behind his giant desk with a tiny, tiny computer screen embedded in yes. it. He beeps and boops at this is the 90s, man. I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, yes, he basically tells Quark to work it out. Yeah. Uh, and Quark is like, oh, I'm sorry, but like, I can't. Like, literally against the law. Yes, well, not Federation law, as he yeah. points out. The Federation holds the lease to yeah. your bar. And, I mean, Cisco straight up blackmails him. Let's see. Five years of back rent plus power consumption... Plus repairs. Do you know how much latinum that is? A lot. I'm pretty sure that's not legal. You know, that's... You're right that it's not strictly legal. On the other hand, I mean, he would have been within his rights to charge that rent anyway, right? Yes. Because they, they haven't been charging but, him rent yeah. for power no. or, or maintenance. But then to suddenly go like, well, now if you don't do what I want, I'm going to back charge you this thing. That, yeah, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't stand up very much in a... <laughs> In which court, though? Yeah. Would it stand him in Bajoran court? Would the emissary's decision be questioned by a Bajoran court? Like, he's... he's it's yeah. definitely... He's playing dirty. Yeah. But he's playing dirty to Cork. Yeah. Who I think respects that. Yeah, okay. I think that's what Cisco's strategy is. Like, reason is weakness. Yeah. You know, he's got to show that he can act like a Ferengi. Yeah. In order to earn a Ferengi's uh, respect. And Quark goes like, okay, 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 I'll end this dispute. And he does it in the way that a Ferengi would do this. He goes to Rom and offers him a bribe. (laughs) (laughs) I've seen this episode so many times. I've most recently seen it two months ago. I still forgot about this. (laughs) It's so, so good. Because Rom is... Clearly trying to get himself up to spec on how unions work and how labor disputes work. Because he's surrounded by all these pads yes. that he's reading from. And Quark tosses another pad on there and goes like here. And what's that? It's like my offer. It's like the bribe I'm offering you. And slip strips or bars. Uh, slips. slips. Oh, okay, strips. Forget it. Yeah. I mean, Roman is like, no, no, I wouldn't even take it if it was bars, because like this is more important than Latinum. Yeah. And Throughout this, I was watching Quark, actually. Like, the first times that, I, that I've seen it, I was always watching Rom to see his rise to power, which is mm-hmm. genuinely amazing to see. But to see Quark, he thinks that this is the, the end game. It's not a, a gambit he's doing. It's not even an appeasement. No. He thinks that this is, okay. And of course, it's going to work. Yeah. I've lost, and yeah. this is what I have to do. And the fact that it's still not good enough is just a complete shock. 
Oh, yes. He's got a genuinely disgusted expression on his face uh, at the end of it. Like, when he says, what's happened to you? It's like, he's got this, like, genuine disgust uh, when after Rom quotes Marx at him. Yes. <laughs> Workers of the world, unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Woof! But it is an interest. He, he gets everything that he said to Rom thrown back at his face, like, well, about, like, well, we were not brothers when it comes to business. Oh, yeah, yes. very good. Any of that, like, oh, but you're my brother. Can't we settle? And he's like, nope. This is like, you told me yourself, there is no brothers in business. Time for a wrinkle. The strategy of scriptwriters to introduce an additional problem to mm -hmm. heighten the, the drama, which is Quark returning to his bar to find... Front. That's liquidator Brunt to you. I see you remember me. Who could forget? It does, in fact, have lobes everywhere. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Which, hopefully, they don't practice too much umox on themselves, <laughs> as Rom did. Yes. Thereby establishing the first admission of the existence of any kind of masturbation in all of Star Trek <laughs> ever. <laughs> Wow. And it's Brunt and two Norsicans. Yes. Menacing figures. We know them as the species who uh, stabbed Jean-Luc Picard in the heart in his oh, youth. Oh, yes. They're known as brutish, violent fighters. And yes, and apparently they don't just stab other people, because, like, at one point they're, like, throwing darts at each other in the background. I know, like, it's so great. Your boyfriend's eyes went real, real wide. Yes. <laughs> um. These Nauticans were played by James Lohman and Sean McConnell, specifically for the scene in the episode where they throw darts at each other. They're professional darts players. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you don't really need a professional dart player to hit the other guy from, like, literally across the table, but it, I guess it helps. Like, yeah, make I sure guess also for, like, insurance purposes, like, uh, they're yeah. definitely going to hit the padded area yeah, under exactly. the uniform <laughs> and not accidentally in stabbing someone else. But yes, Brunt is there to... The Ferengi Commerce Authority has ordered me to end this nasty little labour dispute of yours. And then there's a new union meeting where Rom tells everyone, hey, he just tried to bribe me. Yeah, did you take it? It's like... <laughs> yes. <laughs> which like, is like the immediate response of the other Ferengi, which is like completely in character. Yeah, because it's not completely <laughs> judgmental. It's just they've sort of forgotten kind of, you know, the concept of unions is new. The concept of bribes, very familiar. And he says no. And Rom very acutely says, okay, this means that he's desperate. Right? Yes. Because that was end game for Quark. So the fact that he did this means we're winning. We yeah. just need to hold we out a little longer. Stay strong. But he's interrupted by the fizzling of the door behind him. Yes. There's a little bit of... Uh, I almost thought there was like going to be two Jedi breaking into that door. Uh, in, in one. <laughs> you see a lightsaber come through the door and then uh, open it up. But yes, it's Brunt with his goons. Yeah. Who has come to tell them that... Uh, this is over. We're not doing this. Uh, one of the uh, Ferengi immediately uh, caves. <laughs> Froomey drops to his knees. It's not my fault. It's their fault. They forced me to do it. They made me do it. <laughs> it reminds me of a scene from, I think I've quoted it before, Malcolm in the Middle, where just out of nowhere, the mother of the house calls for Malcolm, and Malcolm immediately responds with, I didn't do it. And his brother immediately chimes in with, yes, he did. I saw him. No idea what, <laughs> what was going on. About. No context. <laughs> just this uh, reflex action. I love, uh, there's also one where uh, basically mom is upset about something and dad goes like, I'll give you 10 bucks if you take the fall for this one. And he goes like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Froome is groveling before Brunt and his goons and the rest of the union are not quite sure what to do about it. Like, there's a real risk that everyone will follow suit. He basically tells them what would happen to them on Ferenginar if they had tried this here, which is basically getting tossed off the Tower of Commerce. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is kind of gruesome, but, you know. Yeah, Froome offers... I'm old. I'm fragile. <laughs> I'll push the rest of them off myself. Yes. Oh, yeah. God, he's such a groveling, uh, sniveling little bastard. And Grimp even confronts him with it. Yeah. I thought you said you weren't afraid of the FCA. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, he tells them, no, instead, since we can't do that here because we're on a civilized starship here, mm. we'll just, like, you know, freeze all your funds on Ferenginar, find your family, and all yep. of that. Which, basically, Rom calls his bluff on after they've left. Because he basically, yeah. if, <laughs> if you had anything worth it on Ferenginar, you wouldn't be waiting tables here on DS9. Woof. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Which, I mean, yeah, good point, I guess. And his whole thing is, like, nothing has changed. Yep. Absolutely nothing has changed. We're still this close to winning. 
everybody's on his side, thanks to Lita, who's, yeah. a, who's a fantastic... Uh, Again, yes, the, the, the non-Ferengi union members, they shouldn't have a problem. Like, I was like, okay, yeah, he's making threats. You know. Yeah. Great, good for him. Who is he? Like, yeah, no jurisdiction. <laughs> yeah. Never going to Ferenginar. Named for the first time on screen, by the way. Who's, who is? Ferenginar. The oh, whole right. planet of the Ferengi. Oh, okay. And what about Froom? Well, leave him there on the ground where he belongs. Pretty yeah. addictive, but it's, yeah, he's a scab. Yep. And that's that's one of the, uh, I mean, necessary, you know, uh, yeah. phenomena when it when it comes to union actions like strikes, but also one of the less excellent things: the sort of shunning and shaming of strike breakers, scabs, yes. traitors to the cause. Absolutely, O'Brien and. Worf seem to have laid their uh, difference aside because now it's those two on the second level of the promenade standing yeah. there watching the strikers go uh, back to the picket line. And I think this is really great because uh, there is a reading of this which is a sort of a, an unhealthy, macho thing like, oh, good punch-up is something that just happens every now and again between friends. That's yeah. not the case. Because they, they sort of talk to each other like... I feel I owe you an apology. I allowed our argument in Quarks to get out of hand. I think there was plenty of blame to spread around. Yes, and Worf basically says, like, yeah, I shouldn't have let it come to that. I was just, like, irritated about the whole situation here, and I took it out on uh, you two. Oh, that's probably why he went to Quarks in the, in, in the first place. Yeah, just, like, get a drink in and... Uh, to settle his nerves, and then yeah. instead, one of his friends... He gets ha harassed, yes. But he found a solution. I'm going to move my quarters to the Defiant. So... Now I'm in trouble again, or now I'm a little frustrated again. So that yeah. means that the Defiant is always docked and empty. He stated this. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm saying this very explicitly to you, Mark Nixon of the Shadows at the Door podcast, friend of the show. Yeah. But Mark Nixon, you took the time to talk to me about this and advise me. No, no, actually. Oh, no, I'm not going to do a voice for Mark the Nixon, defiant, obviously. The Defiant is going to be, is, is off on uh, doing Worf missions. Is, Worf is in command. And, and, yeah. and But my, my whole scenario is you have this mobile weapons platform with incredible sensors that should be patrolling. And instead, it's just sitting around as a, a Japanese capsule hotel with no visitors except <laughs> Except for Worf. Yes. Uh, I mean, we don't know how often Worf is out on the ship. I mean, but yeah, you'd think that they'd do a rotation and... Uh, yeah. Nothing but love, by the way. This was a... Hey, Daddy Daddy wasn't mad at you. And, uh, <laughs> this, I was trying to do a little joke and I'm just not very good at jokes sometimes. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Please do another recommendation. Oh, and now everybody's heard me. I feel like Worf for overreacting. Oh, what have I done? <laughs> Maybe you should go and uh, quarter on board the Defiant. No, it's so oh. lonely. That'd be like that'd be like O'Brien's life on the Enterprise. Lonely. <laughs> Quark oh. comes talk to Rom again. Yes, who has just walked Lita to her quarters. Yeah. I've got to get ready. I'm having dinner with Julian. He's a lucky man. And almost as brave as you are. She kisses him on the forehead. So uh, they, they later have the sort of relationship with Julian end at some point mm -hmm. in a really kind of excellent Bajoran tradition, which is when two people realize, you know, our relationship has ended, often it's sort of celebrated or closed off with a holiday and a bang fest. And okay. just like, yeah. yeah, we're done. We can just enjoy one another and enjoy ourselves and get that out of our system and just like leave on a high note. Yeah. Which sure. is really yeah. lovely. That sounds like a good idea. Sounds like a healthy tradition, unlike the relationship that Rom and Quark have. Yeah, this is so difficult because now Quark is pleading for Rom's life. Yes, he didn't bring those Nessicans uh, for no reason. Yeah, because he doesn't see any solution. At this point, he just wants his brother not to be killed, yeah. which is something that the FCA apparently can do because the Ferengi Commerce Authority doesn't answer to anyone. No. Which is a breathtaking... However, you'd think that, like, you know... Structure of authority. The Federation and the Bajorans would uh, take umbrage at the Ferengi Commerce Authority just murdering people yes. on board DS9. That might have, you know, consequences. <laughs> then again, maybe it's sort of like in the Dothraki culture in, in Game of Thrones. They have a sacred city within which weapons are forbidden. Yes. Right? And there is no blood to be spilled within the sacred city. And then there's a, a trial held because someone killed someone else. Yeah. And, and the leaders go, this is outrageous. There is no blood spilled in the sacred city. And one of the other ones with a grayer beard goes, well, there's always a little blood. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's not make it... Like, it's not, mm. <laughs> there's never none. Well, yes. And Rom throws this back in Quark's face. If Brunt gets rid of me, then all your problems are solved. 
You always said you wanted to be an only child. And that's a bit of a, uh, well, it's not exactly an eye-opener for Quark, but it is rather confrontational. Yes, and I think it's really valid because mm. it's sort of confronting Quark with, hey, you thought that it was normal to say these things. You thought it was normal to abuse people in yeah. the way that you have, and it wasn't, and we're not accepting it. Yes, because I'm actually, not dumb, and you're not half as smart as you think you are, which yes, is also a fantastic Tom. line. Yeah. <laughs> Quark puts him down to make himself feel smarter. Like, that, yep. that's certainly a component of their unhealthy relationship. Here we have the uh, Nessicans are playing darts at each other. It's <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say at each other, not with each other, because it's... Into each, each other. other. yes. <laughs> like, throwing the darts uh, into each other's bellies. And Brunt starts, like, musing a little bit about how we are supposed to do this. Like, attack the leader of a movement, you risk creating a martyr. No. Rob must not be touched. So we're going to have to hurt someone he has feelings for. And, oh, what about the Dabo girl? Oh, and that like, lovely oh, female. No, yeah, yeah, she's got such delicate loaves. Like, and Quark's even sort of kind of into it. Yeah. Like, make an example out of her. Yeah, yeah okay, okay yeah, yeah, we can do that. I but, could bring myself to giving that order. Yeah. And uh, he calls his goons over, and it is Quark who is getting the beat down. Because who else does Rom care, care about? about? Yes. Oh, it's so unfortunate, but this is like... Oh. <laughs> Me? But I'm on your side. Ironic, isn't it? This is sort of played for laughs a little bit, but of course, this is horrible and terrifying. Oh, yes. And like, in a much less fun version of this podcast, that would be my deleted scene where you actually see the methodical beating yes. that, that Oof, these two gosh, gigantic yes. Norsicans give to this, this one Ferengi before it's apparently interrupted by Odo, who happened to come by to mm. Quark's great fortune. Because, yeah, the bar was largely empty because of the picket line and because of the cleansing uh, ceremony. And a severely beaten Quark is lying on a bio bed. Yes, in, he's uh, got a broken uh, eye socket, his lung was punctured, and there's a few other things that are wrong with him. Does it hurt? Of course it hurts. Bashir isn't very generous with the uh, analgesics. Yeah. You'd think that, like, in the 24th century, they'd have a little bit more pain management in... Uh, yeah. At, or at least a neural suppressor. I mean, like... I mean, pain management is tricky. Having having had recently just the, the, oh, yes. the pleasure of a, a, a multi-month bout of uh, Bruce rib Ribs, injuries yes. by now, I think one of them's broken because it's still... Oh. Oh, they always say that bruised is worse than broken for when it comes to in, ribs. In terms of intensity of pain, yeah. but in terms of longevity, oh, okay. uh, break. So I'm off that now, but yeah, there is the thing where I I didn't want to do exercises while I was on pain management because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to feel if I overstrained. Oh, yes, very good point. Or I was afraid I wouldn't, so yeah, it's a tricky thing. And yeah, it's it, it's another confrontation between the brothers. I love how many scenes there are between Quark and Rom in this episode and how much Quark is changing. Because he thought when he went and offered the bribe to Rom that that was his lowest point. Yeah. And then, like, the FCA came. Like, they're going to kill you, Rom. And yeah. that was his lowest point. And no, now he's been beaten and might even have been killed. Oh, yes. Although, I don't think the intent was to... I mean, they say that, like, if Odo hadn't come by, but I don't think that would have been the intent to actually go ahead and kill him. I mean... Well, where do you get that that wasn't the intent? The point was to make an example of someone. Right. Well, that would make a very interesting thing, because then Rom would have inherited the bar, and then he would have been the new owner. Oh, yeah. Huh. Oh. <laughs> Funny that one. Yeah. Even though it's an open and shut case, yeah. obviously Quark isn't going to press charges. Yeah, but hang on. Pretty sure that Odo doesn't need Quark to press charges. They can always get them for disturbing the peace, and like if they can't get him for, yeah, I mean, fighting, you know? That's possible. Yeah. Well, no, disturbing the peace, it wasn't in a public place. It was in a place of business. Yeah, okay. Still. Um, so it would yeah. be up to, like, you need standing, yeah. Do right? Yeah. And you need to prove damages. And if you don't do either of those, then you uh, really don't well, have that's, a case generally. And Ooh, that's not I, for criminal. That's for private law, not for criminal law, I think. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it also depends on what the hell the Bajoran rules are. Also, we don't know anything about the law and nothing that exactly. we say should, can and should be taken which, as legal advice. Right. Ha ha, lawyers. Which brings me to one, I mean, it's, it's not even worth calling it a warp core, but, you know, the Bar Association. We didn't even press the button I, this I know, time I know, there wasn't one. Yeah. I, 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 I thought about it, but, you know, it's like a Bar Association is a very, means a very specific thing in oh, yeah. US law. No, you know, it, it's a fun little joke. And it has nothing to do with that No, it's just a fun little, like, yeah. the bar is a term used for, you know, the, the legal profession. Right. Wait, well, isn't a bar association, isn't that the union for lawyers? 
Well, it's the, it's not, I wouldn't call it a union, but it's the body that governs who is allowed to practice law. Why? Oh, you my know, God. Bar and barrister. Do you think those are connected? Yes. And you know what bar it is? It's literally oh. that little fence that they have in the courtroom, which you're not allowed to, cr- which you're not allowed to get behind unless you're a defendant or a lawyer. That's the that is the bar. That's you wait. Okay, so it's 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 that is the bar, and therefore someone who's allowed to cross it is a barrister. Is that well, how it works? They, and you have the bar association who decides like who is allowed to how practice high the bar law. Is. Yeah, well, that too, I guess. Do you think lawyers do the lambada? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Which was famously called by the entire family in the the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, the Forbidden Dance, <laughs> the lambada. Oh no. <laughs> Oh, yeah, including by his uncle, who was himself a lawyer or a judge? Ooh, uncle I Phil? I think so, yeah, one of, the, one of the other. Make it look like I've won, and I'll give you everything you want. You'll meet our demands? That's what I just said, you idiot. Even sick leave? Even sick leave. And I think this is, this is brilliant, because it's Quark's idea. He is the clever one. He's the one who figures out deals and opportunities that, mm. that others don't see. Oh, honestly, as Rom does as well. Right. But in this case, like, he sees an option that just hadn't occurred to him before. Mm. Just lie about it. Yeah. <laughs> Which really should be. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> He's been completely willing to surrender by now. Yeah. But surrendering would incur the wrath of the FCA. Right. So what if we just sort of lie about it? Rum is a little bit hesitant because he doesn't trust Quark. He says he goes like, "Well, in six months I'll give you everything you want." He goes like, "Yeah, you can give me. You can give it us next week. Right? You can give it us immediately. The FCA you'll just, will be you'll on just top cut of it. the books like you always do." And, then <laughs> yeah. and like, yeah, I mean, it's like it makes sense to accept this deal. I mean. You just like accept it, like say, "Oh yes, we. Oh no, the strike has been broken." And if a week later Quark doesn't yeah. live up to his promise, then back to striking. Yep, <laughs> it's uh, that easy. Yep, <laughs> wait for Brunt to leave, and as soon as like Quark done at that point doesn't give them what he promised, yeah, it's like it's it's a fairly yeah. it's a fairly safe bet to take. Because they also don't need to make a major announcement or anything. That's not something that Brunt needs from them. No, and he just needs to see that they go back to work. Yeah, I'm thinking about, like, how Brunt sees the situation and how the rest of DS9 sees the situation. Because uh-huh. they're talking about, like, Alita was talking to people and how much support there was for their cause. And, like, if they'd made a, a pronouncement, oh, we've, we've, we've surrendered, well, then it would be hard to get, like, public opinion back on your side if you go back on strike. Mm. But by just quietly going back to work and letting the FCA believe what it believes, yeah. everyone's the happier for it. And yep. those razors are coming in and the hours are being cut because the FCA doesn't care at this point. No. We get one more last scene between Worf and Jatsia, uh-huh. who is still l- massively getting her flirt on. Yep, because he's billeting now on the Defiant, where he removes the mattress from the top bunk. Oh, yes. Oh, much better. And she's like, oh, yes, here, have some opera so you can play it as loud as you want in here while you're all by your onesie. A thoughtful gift, he says. Yeah. <laughs> Because this is a collection of her favorite operas. She's flirting at him so loudly, <laughs> and he's still not, not hearing it. it. Yes. He's so stupid. This is like... <laughs> I had a friend at work and who uh, was a lesbian woman, and she explained to me the sort of intricacies of the sort of courtship in oh. a particular like sect of lesbianism to which right. she belonged, the kind of people that she... I mean, obviously, like you go on a few like dates in public, you have coffee, yeah. you perhaps... Ooh, things are heating up. I shall recommend a book, (laughs) she says excitedly. And then in a few months, we'll have to negotiate a neutral location to introduce our cats to each other and see how that goes. Yes. (laughs) I also heard something about like how hard it is can be when complimenting a uh, like, oh, you look lovely today. And it's like, oh, thank you. Because like, you know, this is apparently a thing that uh, women do a lot more than men compliment each other. But like, no, 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 I love you in a want to f*** you way. It's like, 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 like in... No, you, <laughs> like, you, you look great and, and, and let's bang. Yes. Is, is the thing that I'm into. <laughs> oh, you're such a good friend. No, I'm not. I'm actually a terrible friend. Your friends don't generally want to bang. Well, I say that. Yeah. I say that, but... Mm. Mm. Let's all be healthy Bajorans and like have, have, you know, be open about our desires and our preferences. Quark welcomes everybody back into the bar. Like, oh, we're open. Why don't you try your luck? Have some, uh, do a few Dabo spins. Lita's there as well. Oh, as is the Dopterian, I notice. The the burglar. <laughs> oh, right. Or someone of the burglar species, at least. But, you know, yeah, considering he got how left, things go. Got, got let out again, I guess. Yep. Just get me two mugs of Synthale, a double order of Hasperat, and uh, 
hold the conversation. <laughs> yes. And Quark goes, oh, that's why you're my favorite customer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you just spend your money. <laughs> you leave me to it. But he is in for one la final shock as Rom approaches. And uh, like, why are you not in your... Uh waiter uniform doesn't yeah. even comment on the fact that he's wearing a, a uh, rather smart looking Bajoran yeah. engineering uniform yes exactly gray sleeves and teal chest and front it's a little bit it's a little bit reverse of the look that the uh, starfleet uniforms have in a way no? oh interesting oh actually there's a lot of overlap between this design which is a sort of a, yeah. a one piece sewed together and the I mean, the outfits that the Ferengi usually wear, they have these bolero jackets, right? Right, yes. These very high-waisted jackets go just... Yeah, yeah. And that's essentially what's sewed into the... Like, the, the sleeves of the... No, the I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Go, into the, ...go into the chest as well. Oh, I can't believe that I haven't talked about the, the, the costumes here, by the way. We always talk about the Ferengi costumes, how, like, how elaborately 90s carpet uh, uh, they are. They're so great. And I especially love, since, since we did uh, Family Business, that you added the, the incredible headcanon that they wear these high-waisted pants because culturally those are waders. Yes, because Ferengi now is a very wet place. It's a very wet place. So the, and, and I love it. I'm sure that they're completely waterproof. And that's just Ferengi <laughs> cultural custom. But to Quark's great astonishment, Rom says, I've wiped my last table and mixed my last black hole. Starting today, I'm one of the station's diagnostic and repair technicians. Junior grade. But I'll still fix your replicators and keep your hollow suites working. Uh-huh. So he's still loyal to his brother. Yeah. Yeah. And he says this is going to be good for our relationship. Because, yeah, a little bit of time apart. Yeah. Now get me my snail juice. Brother? Right, yes. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Coming uh. right up. Yeah. Um, so, yes. 416 Bar Association. Which is Rom's rise to power, essentially. Uh, I like, suppose, yes, that's... It's, it's amazing to see this character. I remember when we started our rewatch of DS9, seeing the early episodes with Rom, where he was just a yeah, sniveling, a conniving from Ringy. He was, he was a little bit, yes. Like this. And then just this total character pivot, because he was, you know, hadn't had any episodes about him. Uh, Max Grojentic gave him a completely different performance in collaboration with the writers, resulting in this truly, truly fantastic, like, pupation, you know? He goes into the crucible and the chrysalis, mixing our metaphors, and comes out <laughs> as this beautiful grey and teal uniformed butterfly. Well, we'll see how it develops, but yes. So let's have a look, see what, what other people thought of this episode. IO9 called it a must-watch episode of the series. Good. But not everybody agreed as much, because Michelle Erica Green, who was reviewing the episode for Trek Nation, noted some good scenes for Rom, Worf, and O'Brien, but overall did not find either of the main plots interesting. Okay. Lamenting, I've never been completely sure of the point of having Ferengi on DS9. Which is... Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, like the best part, sort of. Yeah. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, of course, and it's a reasonable opinion. You don't have to like anything, all right? Basically. Yeah. But DS9 is a town. Like, I noticed that when, just before Quark walks in on the Union with all their arms folded. Yeah. He's just walking down the promenade. He sees people going into the Bajoran Temple. It's a street. It's yeah. just a shopping street. Oh, and yes. he's going to his shop. Like a happy cleansing. Is what he actually says to one of the people there. Yeah, <laughs> grumbling. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, uh, you should, yeah. yeah, you should have been in my bar drinking, but uh -huh. uh, yeah. And then he just turns the corner into his shop as a shopkeeper. I love that, that it's a town. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. not the sick bay. It's just it's the environment. Yeah, the, it's the promenade. It's the, the, the bustling center of commerce on uh, DS9. And where there's commerce, there will be Ferengi. All right, so let's see. Hey, I've just had a... Oh, no, I haven't just had an idea. I had a suggestion from Mark Nixon, whom earlier I came at him pretty hard. He suggested, what about doing these reviews at the start of an episode? Oh, yes. Oh, you mean what, the, what, what other people thought about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These, okay. these other perspectives. Yeah. Which, let's give that a shot. I mean, yeah, sure. There wasn't a lot of them uh, in, uh, about this episode to be found, to be honest, but... Uh... I always appreciate the research that you do. So, let's see. All um, right, all right. I have my sound effect for... Is this the one? This is so f***ing cool. Uh, no, but it is f***ing cool. What I'm talking about Captain's is... Captain's Log, supplemental. Yeah. Yes. So, what deleted scenes do have, you imagine? I have a hard time about that. 
But other than that, I mean, I could like... Let's not do the beating that the Nausicans give Quark. <laughs> no, that's, like, that's not one. No, actually, I'm more into thinking of a recurring gag throughout the episode, whereas O'Brien and Bashir keep walking into Quarks in later timepiece outfits, just like <laughs> going through various different battles and conflicts and ending uh, ending up uh, wearing coal miners and going to the, the, oh, to, like to the big the... unionized fight that was being held with the... Uh, Oh my uh, the God. Pinkertons and the, yeah. yeah, the next one is the Anthracite Coal Miners <laughs> Revolt of 1902. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, oh, oh God. <laughs> and they do rock, paper, scissors for who gets to be Sean Aloysius O'Brien yes. and who gets to be the Pinkerton <laughs> who puts 32 or 34 bullets in him. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I've got mine. Let's see if I remember it. Yes, yes. So it starts with an external shot where a uh, different ship that we haven't seen before on DS9 is docked. And then during the scene where Odo talks to Quark and yeah. all those hollow waiters, we see freshly retired from Starfleet Captain Cristobal Rios from uh, Picard, okay. yeah. who's just sitting there moping, Much... drinking his sorrows away, yeah. and just seeing all of these holographic versions of Quark, oh, like staffing all the past, And he, the eyes just go wide. This is what you can do? We have a much younger version of him than because that like Picard takes place twenty years later, or doesn't it? Oh, so, actually, yeah. probably possibly forty years later. Now yeah. I think about it, but let's not worry about that too no. much. He might have gone through a little time warp or whatever. But yes, just, and he's like, oh wow, that's like fantastic this is idea. Oh, I'm gonna do that. And like finishing a drink, running back to last Chas- now. chasing chasing after that merchant that sold. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Quark. Like, can I get one of these systems? I'm like. I'd- <laughs> So, yes, that's going to be mine. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Now, let's see what our beloved chief has selected for us uh, oh, yes. for next episode. Let's see if we can guess it. You mentioned recently that it's difficult to, uh, to select these episodes, and uh, I can understand why. Like, it's a it's a challenge. Yes. I mean, we have some some wonderful recommendations from, from a lot of people, but we have noticed a lot of the recommendations that people send us are, this is my favorite episode, and I like it because it's good. Which yes. Is, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> But with, like, the focus on lesser loved or, like, mundane episodes and, like, unique viewpoints, which if you have one, by the way, you can send to joyoftrek.com slash links where you'll find a link to the form where you can send us your recommendation for an episode of Star Trek that you love more than most people and, and tell us why. We want, like, personal life experiences. Like, in this case, Crimson, who's a union man himself yeah. or a union coy wolf, as he's, uh, as he's mentioned. Uh, All right, bring it on. Bellana says, I'm an engineer, not a costume designer. Hmm? Ooh, I like what this is. Classic, yes. I like what this is. A costume designer, though, I like that. Janeway says, Computer, stand down red alert. This isn't Sabotage 7, this is fan mail. Wait. This isn't Sabotage 7, this is fan mail. Okay, so this, is she talking to she's talking Seven to of Seven. Nine? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's post season four. Yeah. Or season uh, three? Uh, well, it's put me at a massive disadvantage. Today. Janeway says, Tuvok, when have functions aboard the ship ever been normal? Okay, so it's about fan mail. So they're getting some sort of communication. Is, yeah. Uh, a, someone who's been... It's a lot of one-liners so far. Yeah. Something with costumes. Okay. Yeah, so they're... The doctor says, I need your clearance code to delete my medical database. Oh. Whoa! Delete the medical database? What is this for? No idea. Oh, wait. Oh, I've got an idea. Yeah. Let's see. One more. Janeway says, oh, it's perfectly all right, doctor. Or do you prefer maestro? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think this is where he's going to become an opera singer. Okay. The doctor. The doctor, yeah. Okay. Sure. You're completely blank. I have no idea what this is. I've probably not seen this episode. I think it's called, ooh, Virtuoso, let's see. So it is Voyager season six, episode 13. Virtuoso. Fantastic. Nailed yes. It. Excellent. Oh, yeah. oh. You haven't seen this? I don't think so, no. We're going to have a good time. Okay. We're going to have a good time. So, <laughs> I'm always looking forward to uh, watching an episode with you and then nattering about it for an hour and a half afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically what we do. I mean, if, if, if Captain Picard ever sort of walked in on, on what we were doing, he would probably say... The hell is this? I'm leaving Starfleet. Energize! Energize. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed this week's episode with the friends Kay and Kaki. Production and editing by your chief engineer Greg and music by Fox Amour. Join us next time for Virtuoso Voyager Season 6, Episode 13. 
Visit joyoftrek.com slash links to send us your recommendations, support us on Patreon, or to find us on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening to The Joy of Trek, and we'll see you out there.